Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Changing the Climate, the show where we talk about the changing world around us and how we can make it better. Brought to you by Climate Change Realty. The only real estate brokerage that donates 50% of its net commissions to 501c3 nonprofit organizations dedicated to fighting climate change. Arden, really nice to meet you. Thank you so much for taking some time on Saturday morning in Australia to record this podcast with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me here. You are very, very welcome. And what we always like to do is get this show started with a little bit of background on who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing at the current moment. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we're recording this podcast on my end of the traditional lands of the Awapako and Waramai peoples. And I pay my respect to the elders, both past, present and future. Uh, On my end, uh, I graduated a Bachelor of Business and Commerce, majoring in Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Economics in 2019 from the University of Newcastle. I have studied overseas as part of that, so I did a semester abroad in Scotland. And I also... uh, did a short course in Singapore, so that was two weeks there. And I tried to use my electives to gather as much information about entrepreneurship in the business world as possible so I could actually uh, enter into my career with some useful skills. Yeah, I also have quite a vast music and creative arts background. Uh, I have about 20 years of violin experience and uh, I've performed in the World Marching Band Championships. Uh, so that was on trombone. I've performed with an A-grade bus, brass band on tenor horn. So there's there's a few things there. And I also enjoy uh, sewing, drawing, painting in my spare time. So you like creating things, huh? Is that what draws you to entrepreneurship? I do like creative things. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, so that's really what what brought me to the startup world and I don't think I realized that until last year Uh, someone asked me about me and how that lends itself to the work that I'm doing and I realized after going through all the creative things I do that I'm always building and creating and uh, that's why I like startups and that's what frustrates me with the parts of my work that frustrate me because I'm not building or I'm not creating. So that's really my goal. And I think I'll always be working in a startup or creating something. I want to have an area that I can, that I can improve and build. Um, Yeah. For the better too. I love that. First off, shout out class of 2019. Let's go. (laughs) I I graduated in 2018, but I'm technically from class of 2019. So let's go. And we had the same major. I didn't study econ. I actually did a minor in philosophy. I'm not, you know, as hardcore going on the double major with you (laughs) as you did, but um, very, very cool. And then how many instruments do you play? Uh, Well, they're all a bit faded into the background at the moment. Full-time work (laughs) gives me um, less time. But over the years, I've played four or five. I always say it gets easier after your third instrument. (laughs) Jeez. Yeah. And violin for 20 years, which as as far as I understand is the most difficult instrument to learn how to play. Is that correct? Or I think know? you could say that music was actually my first language. So reading, uh, reading music and uh, yes, it's difficult, but I think it's always been part of my life. So it's like, you know, learning English as a second language, but if you've always been speaking it, it's not, not that difficult. Do you compose music? I have done, yes. At the moment, actually, what I'm making as one of my major projects is a murder mystery novel. So I've been planning it for years. And um, one of the most recent lockdowns here in Australia, uh, I just decided to do it. So five minutes every day um, is the goal to sit down and actually write. Um, And if that leans to more than five minutes, that's great. If it doesn't, you know, you've only done five minutes but forcing yourself to think about it for some time every day actually makes a difference all right so let let me get this straight you're a college graduate you play a bunch of instruments you're developing a startup company and you're writing a book (laughs) yes 
Okay. Really, really cool. I, I am wondering what's drawing you to like work in an environmentally focused startup company. Yeah. Uh, I grew up on a property in Australia, so it was only a small acreage. Uh, but my mum grew up on a much larger acreage, uh, basically on, on a cattle farm at times. Um, it was between that and Sydney. So she has also, well, she's been a big influence in my life and she was also a soil scientist and head of viticulture um, at one of the local colleges. So uh, her influence on describing what's happening to the land by being able to look at it and we're very connected to it. I grew up playing most of the time outside. Um, yeah, I think... Being able to listen to the land, she also has a PhD in the rehabilitation of mining landscapes uh, and how people connect and relate to that land. Uh, also being in Australia, I think recognising the, um, the cultural roots here of First Nations people and 60 to 80,000 years of history of connection to land, uh, it's, I would hope, such a massive part of of people here in Australia and um, respecting the place that that feeds us and keeps us safe. Uh, Definitely. So, yeah, the environment side is is very much part of my values, and it doesn't register with me when people don't uh, have that <laughs> that same value for where we live. I don't understand littering at all because mm -hmm. you know it's literally just if you throw it out of your car. It's going straight into the waterways, and you're drinking from those waterways. Let alone, um, let alone from from creating the litter in the first place. It, it comes full circle back to you eventually. Yeah, so the idea of of listening to what the land wants to be is something as a New York born American, I never even like considered at all. And uh, the more you think about it. I don't know if it's like the, the the natural world speaks to you, but there's some sort of feeling that I, I consistently when I talk to environmentalists, they have this connection when they go out into nature and they and it makes them feel whole. Um, it's hard to communicate that through a podcast, though. Definitely. But, um, I experienced a huge connection to land when I went to Scotland. And so yeah. I have um, quite a few of my ancestors from Scotland. And I think it's just this feeling you can't explain is being drawn to somewhere or just feeling at peace. Um, and it can be as immediate as crossing over a waterway and then suddenly you just feel like at peace because it's ancestral lands. And I think it's really important to try to um, show particularly, um, particularly European people in Australia how, how it would feel to be Aboriginal in Australia and feel so connected to somewhere that you just need to feel it. Yeah. So when I lived in, in Sydney, um, it was kind of my first exposure to this contention between what people call colonizers and indigenous people. I had never really heard anything about that. You know, we have like Thanksgiving where there's a story where we all share a meal. Now there's, now there's a lot of discussion. I know it wasn't that long ago, like five years ago, but it seems that this discussion is kind of coming to the surface more and more. And I don't really have an opinion on it, but it's, it's very interesting. I really love indigenous culture. The idea of seeing yourself as part of the system is something I'm obviously more interested in now that I'm about um, fostering a regenerative economy but so uh, as far as common interest between two of us i'm wondering what are your thoughts on the role that the uh the private sector the business for-profit world has to play in uh fostering like good environmental stewardship or helping fight climate change yeah in australia the private sector is really important so australia hasn't been um our government hasn't been as proactive in setting policies um, as some of the other um, major economy governments uh, so private sector is really what's driving it. On the business side, uh, businesses in uh, any sort of industry that is not clean um, or not supporting the circular economy have a desire to survive. So if you're a thermal power station, they are becoming uneconomical, um, uneconomical and they, that is proven and they know that and they know they're going to close down earlier than expected. 
Uh, and so then they end up with these massive assets and they have nothing to do with it. Um, if they don't work out what to do in this transition, then they're just going to cease to exist. And the sole purpose of, of businesses, at least when I was going through business school, which I don't think is necessarily what the focus should be on, but we were told we we had to make money. That was the point of business was to make profit for the shareholders. Uh, and so if these um, double power stations don't work out what to do, they're not going to be making any profit for the shareholders. The other side is that uh, investors, uh, investors basically, the whole point of their business model is to make money. And if they are not investing in something that is secure for the future and secure for this clean energy transition, then they're not going to make money. And there's so many uh, impact investors popping up who are only investing in uh, sustainable businesses for the future, and that can be um, in hiring practices, in food, um, in so many different elements, uh, but including clean tech and technology um, for the sustainable energy transition. Yeah, you got good old Milton Friedman telling you that shareholder supremacy is the only thing to go after. I will throw this, I'll, this will probably be the last anecdote I'll throw in, but the most difficult class I ever took was literally like introduction to finance at University of New South Wales. And I was on pass fail when I was in Sydney. Yep. And like, all you had to do was get a 50 to pass. And I was like, not on track to get a 50. I like, my brain does not work financially. So I had me and my ex-girlfriend, she had to like quiz me for like six hours sitting out on the green to finally, and finally I got like a 80 five on the exam, which is like an A in, in America. But yeah. I love the way the, the Aussies uh, look at business. And what I always thought was very interesting is how little your economy was affected by the, uh, the Great Recession. But that doesn't have anything to do with climate change. Um, well, perhaps that? it does. Yeah. Did I case did I case study the Great Recession? Yeah, because when I went through business school, that was basically, well, for economics, it was always like, this is what we did. And this is why we avoided the recession in Australia um, but like obviously we looked at the, the um, great recession overseas as well and how it affected America or how it happened in the first place but in Australia um, yeah just just how we boosted the economy um, because it was always talking about it and I can imagine the next a lot of business students going through always talking about how um, like the recessions of, of COVID and um, how we tried to stimulate the economy with that, if it worked, if it didn't work. Yeah, yeah that's, that's an interesting thought. Did you, um, do you think it's because they like were diversified into different assets? Cause like the real, the big cause of the, the uh, recession was these mortgage backed securities and these, I was literally just watching the big short the other day. Yeah. Um, do you, do you, so you said you did a whole case study on it. Do you know why exactly Australia was less affected? Yeah, it was. Um, so, so our economy isn't, isn't quite the same as well. Like we're often called a, a dumb economy because of the resources we export. Uh, so there was that different structure, but the main thing we was talked about was the um, economic stimulus that <laughs> there's apparently a very famous discussion of the um, Prime Minister and the Treasurer at the time on a flight. You know, they knew this emergency was happening and they had to do something. Uh, and basically they decided to give out um, stimulus packages to uh, every household. So um, every, I think every household got $1,000 and that was just people spent it on everything, TVs, painting, you know, whatever they needed. I think my parents spent it on a septic system and we bought an incubator for <laughs> hatching chickens. So, yeah, it's just that it gave people the confidence that we um, that our economy was going to keep going. And as you know, uh, spending is all about consumer confidence and uh, that that circle just, just keeps going. If people are spending money, the economy is going to keep growing. Definitely. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And that's interesting because when you think about the, the more recent potential COVID recession that only lasted like a month, that's exactly what the U.S. did. They pumped out these giant unprecedented stimulus packages, but then we could get talking, start talking about um, overinflation and devaluation of the U.S. currency. I've also been reading, you probably love this book, uh, Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order by Ray Dalio. 
Um, it's really cool. It's, it's like, it's a big, it's like all about macroeconomics exactly yeah. in your wheelhouse. Um, so you mentioned that the term thermal power station, is that, is that a coal powered station? Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. So as far as like when it comes to transitioning our economy to be powered by renewables, um, can you explain a bit why like energy storage is such a huge part of that puzzle? And then of course we'll start talking about your current venture. Yeah. Uh, Renewable energy is intermittent, so it's not always being produced. In Australia, some of our largest renewable energy um, generation is solar power, and that's only made during the day. Luckily, we have a lot of solar uh, in Australia, but there are also days that are less sunny, uh, and again, at night, it's not being produced. So we've got this massive um, load shift that needs to happen that uh, peak demand, and this is economics, it's all supply and demand. Peak demand is uh, in the evening. And we've basically got to, to shift uh, when energy is being produced to when it's being required. And the other complex part there is that a lot of our grid infrastructure is made for those coal power stations and synchronous generators that run consistently have this um, thing called inertia, which is essentially a buffer. So it's always running, it's always spinning. Uh, and they just produce mass amounts of electricity. And our grid is set up for that. So uh, it's a bit difficult to just switch to intermittent renewables. And one of the best ways of, of transitioning when energy is generated is through energy storage and there's a few different types of energy storage and I think mm. in the future they will all be part of the solution. There's not going to be one fix all but they all have a purpose. Very good. Now let's talk about one of them. What is <laughs> MGA Thermal, that your, your company? Yeah, uh, that's it. I'm the business development officer at MGA Thermal. And MGA Thermal is the inventor and manufacturer of MGA materials. Uh, our CEO, Eric Kesey, is one of the inventors and spent nearly a decade researching this material before he decided that someone needed to commercialise it uh, and the world would be better with it. So um, he decided to, to take that on. Uh, basically, we're empowering renewables through energy storage. And we want to revolutionise systems that already exist uh, by bringing in this, this new type of energy storage. And it looks like a brick, just like a black house brick. Um, I've got some dimensions here. If you're in inches, <laughs> it's 8 inches, by 8 yes. by 4 inches. Yeah, so we're in millimetres and it's about 200 by 200 by Oh, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> At least we're consistent. Uh, so shots fired. Yeah. <laughs> so we have this this brick, eight by eight by four. Uh, it looks like a black brick, and it's works like a chocolate chip cupcake. And we love that analogy because we love food. And we've got the cake, which is the graphite, and the uh, uh, chocolate chips are aluminium particles. And within the black brick, you've got those particles dispersed, just like how a cake has uh, chocolate chips dispersed within it. And when you heat up a chocolate chip cupcake, the chocolate chips melt, but they stay in the same spot because the cake matrix are holding them there. And so we've got the same thing. Uh, but the graphite holds the aluminium particles in place. So they go through a phase change and they store latent heat. Uh, they become molten and then they refreeze when, we've, um, when we take the energy out. So the graphite is essentially the heat transfer matrix to melt the aluminium. Uh, and that's how it stores energy. And traditional thermal energy storage deals with either a solid 
that has varying temperatures or a molten material which stores in latent heat, which is very effective. But then they've got the containment issues of, of a molten material. Uh, so trying to store molten aluminium is very difficult um, engineering material-wise. And so having this block that contains it within it, you've still got the density uh, and the molten phase change, but it's a lot easier to store and it reduces a lot of costs uh, with containment issues. So it's difficult, but your company has created this graphite product that can hold liquid aluminum in it. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 pretty similar. Yeah, so that's it. The, the graphite contains aluminium particles, and graphite's like carbon. So what what you imagine, um, like graphite pencils and things, and that that just comes in in a powdered form and. We make them, to further the cupcake analogy, we make yes. them in a, in, a, in a big mixer, put the graphite, the aluminium, some, some other secret ingredients in there, uh, and we uh, press it. We, we mix it up, we press it into the shape, uh, and then we bake them. And then, and then you've got a cupcake or energy storage. Really cool. And do you know anything about how batteries work? Yeah, a little bit. It's like there's like it's like a coating of some sort of metal and then there's like acid on one side and then it like flows to the other side and then it's out of energy or something. How does this like compare to like a battery? Yeah, so um batteries store energy uh chemically and electrically uh and we are storing it thermally. Uh and there's a few differences there. So when I say thermal, I mean heat. Uh, yeah. And that's why the particles melting is such a big part of the energy storage. Uh, and batteries are going to be an essential part or already are an essential part of uh, energy storage and the energy reliability systems here uh, because they have such an, an instant um, uh, response time. So within milliseconds, they can um, be supporting the grid and that's essential for um for the transition, uh, and they can release energy straight away, as in in the form of electricity. Uh, and we store it in heat, so we have to have a way to convert it back into electricity, or it can be used as heat. So there's a few applications which are appropriate for MGAs, and uh, one of them is actually converting those thermal power stations, the coal power stations, which we mentioned earlier. Um, they're becoming uneconomical. Uh, but the first part of the power stations that actually wear out and would be the most worn out when they shut down, uh, decommissioned, is the boiler itself, so the part that contains the coal. Uh, we can take that out, take out everything to do with the coal mm -hmm. and put in an MGO thermal uh, energy storage unit, uh, which we're working on with our um, collaboration partners, E2S Power, who are based in uh, Switzerland. So you take out the boiler, put in the MGA thermal unit, and then you reuse the turbine, uh, the grid connection, the converters, everything that's already there, uh, and then that becomes a renewable energy storage facility. So your product can turn a coal-fired power plant into a giant battery storage for renewable energy. Am I understanding yes. that right? Yeah. Um, but it's a heat-powered battery versus like a Tesla battery is like chemicals or what, what were the three types of energy we were talking about? Thermal, chemical, and what else? So it's definitely, it's easiest to understand batteries as electrical because it's got less of a conversion step. Yeah. Yeah. And because energy comes in, in different forms. Why we work so well with the thermal power stations is because the graphite aluminium product, our core product at the moment, uh, stores heat at 660 degrees, which is the same heat that the turbine requires, the steam. So we heat, we use the product to heat water, which becomes steam which then drives the turbine, which makes the electricity. 
the electricity could come back in during the day and be charged. A charge out MGA is using uh, resisting like power. So just, just a really basic cheap resistance power, which is great. And that's quite an efficient conversion into heat. And then you've got the conversion from heat back into electricity. So these are called miscibility gap alloys. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Um, do they wear out over years? So that's one of my favorite parts um, of our product is that as long as it's in the form of a brick, it will work. And with accelerating cycle testing it, uh, and we can predict it's going to last at least 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may last a lot longer. Um, but at the end of its lifetime, when it starts to, um, if it starts having any wear and tear and breakdown, we just basically crush them back up, sieve them out, and then you've got the materials to repurpose again. Oh, cool. And it's, yeah. wait, and, and graphite is, is made out of carbon, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's the, it's the same compound. So it's, I think it's, it's a different chemical structure, but it's very similar. Yes. But it's like reusable carbon with aluminium in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other like use cases for, for the product so far that you're aware of? Definitely. Um, another really great one is industrial waste heat capture. So because we have uh, this product, which is really efficient at capturing and storing heat, it's very dense and it gets hot. Uh, we can use that as a buffer or to capture heat. So even if um, someone mentioned pottery kilns um, to me the other day as a use case, uh, and you can imagine heating requires a lot of electricity. And mm -hmm. if you can heat something up once and then restore that heat to use again, then that's going to save a lot of electricity. Um, and actually around 50% of the world's um, energy use is in heat. So if we can capture some of that and help that become renewable and more efficient and clean technology, uh, rather than needing to um, go back to the, to the grid, which may or may not be clean energy, uh, then that will significantly help emissions as well. Well, this is even cooler than I thought when I looked you guys up. This is this is some <laughs> awesome stuff, and it's just the the cutting edge, isn't it? So cool to be involved in just like the beginning of the company. I'm curious, like what your day to day life is kind of looking like, what you're doing at for business development, who you're kind of networking with, and trying to get this product rolled out. There's so many things that I do. I was the first hire um, at the business, so let's go. Yeah, we were founded in 2019 and I actually did an internship with them that year. And that was, um, we founded out of the University of Newcastle, but I actually met them through a contact I met in Singapore who they had also met in another country. And she said, hey, these guys are looking for an intern so that, um, you know, they can basically have some business advice. Uh, and at the end of my internship, uh, I knew I was looking for a position at the end of my university. And uh, to be honest, it was more like I was interviewing them, uh, but I got a position. And uh, yeah, it was, I suppose the rest is history. I made part time to begin with to allow for their budgeting full time um, in the second half of, of 2020. And it's been great to watch how um, clean tech has developed even over the last two years throughout um, COVID. So that's it's a really great industry to be part of, to see it still changing and developing. Uh, I do a lot of things. Uh, most of all, I think... Oh, a lot of Saturday things. podcasts. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Saturday podcasts. <laughs> Uh, I have looked at the energy market, competitor research, I've created pitching and investment documents and even pitched to some, some more local investors. Uh, I network and have coffee discussions, which is one of my favourite parts. I uh, have sales discussions. Um, I do some business planning and strategy. Um, 
one of the things that we really want to spend some more time on is an impact analysis um, of our product. Uh, as I was saying, we can reuse the thermal power station sites and we can use recycling materials to make our NGAs and we can recycle at end of life. So we're thinking we could be the lowest carbon energy storage out there, but we want to make sure and actually analyse the impact that our product would have and how how that's so different from, from what's on the market. Um, and investors do get... Um, kind of shiny eyes about green field renewable energy storage. You know, it's a, it's a lot more attractive to think they're making something from scratch. But if we can show the impact analysis between uh, something that's that's built from scratch or the, the demolition of local environment, um, the transport of materials, all the concrete used, um, everything used to make that site versus reusing something that's there, all of the grid connection. Um, the turbine, all of that material would keep the jobs um, of, of people who currently work there who know how to maintain the plant. So that was a bit of a sidestep. I also do lots of marketing and media, uh, graphic design. I write content for the website uh, and the newsletter when I get time. Uh, last year, I also started focusing on our inclusivity and creating a diversity and inclusion committee. Um, I've helped us transition to inclusive hiring practices through a platform called Applied, uh, which uses um, work sample questions instead of CVs, engagement surveys. Uh, there's just lots of things I do, and a lot, lot of things kind of falls into the business category um, over all of the engineers that work on, on making this happen. So it's been really great to have this as my first position um, from university and just getting a bit of a taster of everything, working out what I want to do. Uh, and then hopefully I can um, take a direction that I know I'm really passionate in. Arden, it definitely sounds like you're working in a startup company, doing, <laughs> yeah. a, doing a million and a half different things. I, I, I feel you on that. Uh, yeah. We're running a one man show over here at Climate Change Realty. So uh but that's that's really awesome. It's honestly really impressive, and it's yeah, it's cool to be able to like talk to you across the seas. Um, I'd love to hear more about the um, the impact analysis once once you get more traction on that. Get you guys over to the big the big Kahuna over here, America. We need to get these coal powered uh, stations shut down over here as well, and that's a really cool option that I've never even heard of. Is there any communication going on between any large coal pow coal fired power plants that are are showing interest in a transition like this? Seems like a, a it seems like it could be a really cool pitch, but then you know they're probably like classic old school. So I was just wanted to ask you that. Yeah, we're definitely having um, discussions and our partners e to us um, power um, are setting up um, some some large scale demonstrations uh, over in Europe. Um, but unfortunately, I can't tell you any of the names yet. That's what I figured. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other part that I enjoy um, in my role is that everyone is so welcoming and encouraging and we had a large order to get off to um, our partners in Maine in the US, um, Peregrine Turbine Technologies, and uh, it was all hands on deck. So I was out there in the workshop helping finishing off the blocks as well um, and that was really great to actually physically, um, you know, being reminded of what we're doing and feeling like I, I physically contributed to, to creating that order. Yeah. Well, there's, it sounds like there's a huge potential for impact. So that's why I think your your company is really, really cool. I'm wondering uh, for people who are listening, who are interested in starting a business or getting involved in a startup or, or getting involved in an impact opportunity, I'm wondering what you've learned in your first three, three years working in this kind of, what do I call it? Like trailblazing space. Like it's a whole new industry that we're kind of working on right now. Yeah. I think... I've learned a lot and a lot of what I've learned, you know, it's such a big transition from university to a startup. So you've got the transition from full-time work. You've got the transition from your first career job. Um, you, I've got the, I was working with the founding team and a lot of them haven't had management experience even. So, so 
working out how to self-manage, self-motivate, um, working out where I thought the best initiatives for the company were, all of that confidence that goes into um, making a decision and going with it and and hopefully finishing things because motivation can be hard to follow through. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of things about self-management and I, I really enjoyed um like I, I wrote a, a massive diversity report. We have um, a bit of a, a problem with diversity at the moment and largely that comes from um, employing the experts in this field and from University of Newcastle. They um, uh, are not very diverse, so we're looking at increasing um, why, how to do that, what signals the company's sending, and that's been really exciting to get um, my hands into, especially with my interest and background in behavioural economics, looking at, at all of the behaviour and how we can signal things um, to even nudge people into making the decisions we want and applying to work for us. I love it. Um, I'm sitting here trying to think of like, the biggest, most successful startup company that's come out of Australia. And the only one that I can think of is Yellowtail Wine. So I'm curious if you you know any that Australian companies that have scaled out like around the world off the top of your head. Yeah, uh, Culture Ants Australian. That's um, a pretty big, um, that's a performance review um, employee engagement platform that we use as well. Um, there's lots, but off the top of my head, that's a bit tricky. Um, and I think Australia has this, um, really great, uh, foundation in inventing things as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just crossing that, that chasm of, of inventing and commercializing. So like Australia invented Wi-Fi. And Australia invented Wi-Fi. Yeah. That's something that's used globally. So, uh, yeah, we just need to support our inventors a bit more, I think. Yeah, please do. I've I've heard of Wi Fi. Um, I definitely I definitely use that. So so that's really cool. Yeah. So Australia, if, correct me if I'm wrong, forty million people. Do you, do you happen to know the population? I know America's like three three hundred something. Oh, I uh, might need to Google uh, that. She I'm looks like sure. she's going for the Google. Um, but. <laughs> But point being, it's Australia, a developed nation, developed economy, uh, was originally a, a British, you know, settlement. And um, so, you know, we we in the West live, have very large carbon footprints. And, you know, the US, we're like the biggest, we were like the biggest historical emitters of CO2 emissions. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on Australia's role for like fostering global sustainability compared to like these big players like China or US or the whole European Union. Um, yeah, because it's just, it's interesting to, to see what people think their position is. I don't know. I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, it's 25.7 million. So a bit less than you thought. Not even. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the size, it's the size of the continental U S there's a big, yeah. lot of land, probably like, as you were saying, there's a lot of export, there's a lot of resources, like your economy is mostly focused on exports, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I think maps can be very deceiving. Deceiving. Australia is massive. Um, Huge. And we do, yeah, we do have that mining resource background. Uh, and I mean, that probably comes from um, when white settlers came and um, saw that there's there's gold and we had that whole gold rush period. Uh, and then, you know, there's Newcastle's always had coal. Um, you can see it on the beaches. You can see it in the cliffs. Uh, so there's the Hunter Valley, which is kind of um, in, is around the, the region that Newcastle is in. The Hunter Valley uh, has massive, massive um, coal mines. Uh, and Newcastle, I think, is still the largest coal port in the world. Um, wow. And, yeah, so there's there's a lot of coal. Coal is in our blood, <laughs> which it's definitely in my lungs. There's a, there's a railway you, not too far away from here. Are you all selling it to, to China mostly? Uh, the, China is a very large customer for the mm -hmm. coal, yeah. So there's been, um, there's been a few trade um, discussions recently, and I'm not sure uh, how much of it is currently going to China. Um, but China um, historically has been a very large customer for our coal. Uh, so 
so yes, Australia has been a massive um, resource exporter uh, for multiple things, predominantly coal. Uh, and I think going into the future, we don't actually need to shift very far from that history. I think we can continue to export at the core of what it is. Uh, coal is energy. And if we can take our sun and take our expert inventing and and uh, manufacturing background, we can turn the sun into green hydrogen and we can continue to export hydrogen um, and we can continue to export uh, energy storage uh, and become still a great resource exporter and not stray from our modern history roots, uh, but do it in a way that supports the clean energy transition. I love it. What are, you, what are your plans for the future? Where do you think you're headed? Well, there's still a lot of exciting things happening at MGA Thermal. Of course. Uh, yeah, we are expanding. We uh, are currently moving to a new manufacturing site, uh, and that's going to be massive. It's very exciting. At the moment, we don't have enough space, office space for everyone who's in the company, uh, and that will be fantastic to have everyone in the same building again. Yeah. Uh, and then and then we'll just see. I love building things. So so wherever the most exciting building thing is, I think I would always prefer, I understand it's not always the circumstance, but I'd always prefer to work in a company that I believe in and that I think is making a, a positive difference to the world. And another passion of mine is inclusion. And I think any company that um, works towards just helping people to not have those unconscious biases um, and working to include um, people who deserve to be included. And, um, and I'll be on board with that too. Um, clean energy is really a very exciting place to be at the moment. Indeed it is. Yeah. I think you're beyond on the right track. I think you're totally killing it. It's been awesome having you on the podcast. I always just love to ask at the end, any advice you have for other entrepreneurial types of people who are passionate about creating products or changing the world for the better? Yeah, definitely. I went through my university experience just saying yes to everything. And sometimes that led to a very overwhelming semester uh, but the opportunities I got out of that were amazing. Um, and I was research assistant to the Dean of the Business School for a while um, and um, helping Morris Outland, who was our Dean at the time, uh, edit and research some of his next upcoming behavioral economics books. And so I loved that experience. One of those, that's why I went to Scotland saying yes, why I went to Singapore. That's how come I got this um, experience at, at MGA Thermal was um, the the woman, uh, Lisa Slodre, I met at a networking event in Singapore. I introduced myself to her at the end of the talk she gave and said, hi, I'm the president of Business and Commerce Student Association at the University of Newcastle. If you're ever around, we'd love to host an event so that other students can you know, hear your wisdom and, and um, pick up some of, some of your advice. And, um, yeah, she just connected me to, to MGA Thermal. So I think always putting yourself out there and saying yes, um, meeting people, asking for advice in Newcastle. Everyone is very open to having a coffee. And I think it's very similar in a lot of places of the world. Um, if you just message someone and say, hey, I'd love to, if you have a question, um, I'd love to talk about this. If you have time to have a coffee, that would be amazing. Um, sometimes, especially in the startup world, we're a bit busy. And so pestering does go a long way um, because we, we want to, to talk to you. It's just, it's just a bit hard to, to find the time to commit to it and to, to follow through. So I, I love just having, having chats, finding mentors, so many women in particular um, in clean tech but in business have um, offered to mentor me and have been willing to to see me on a regular basis to to make sure that I'm going okay. I think um, in the past there's been quite a history that women now, professional women, want to make sure that they have the that I have the experience they wish they had. So 
that's just amazing to have so many um, strong professional women um, in my network. I think that's great. I think you're amazing. And I think your company (laughs) has a huge opportunity. So thank you for taking some time to come on the podcast today to share it with me. I'm excited to see where MGA goes and where Arden goes as well. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All right, everybody. So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrboulder.com today.